Hello and welcome to Lively and Disagreeable. Um, we will give everybody a moment or two to, uh, to get settled and uh, for folks to join us. Uh, so um, I think this has been billed as, uh, as, as, as plenty of, uh, of debate going on. So grab the popcorn. I think that's how the meme goes. Yeah. Um, but uh, for those of you not familiar with this platform, um, I, I know that, uh, that we weren't until a couple of uh, weeks ago. Um, you, you should be able to uh, manipulate this one. So, it, so if you wanted to make the, um, the images better uh, to, see, uh, to see our guests, uh, you can move around um, and uh, uh, some of the other boxes. And you'll also find some, uh, some resources uh, to, to give you more information uh, about uh, about our guests. You'll also see, hopefully, uh, the comment or the chat function. So I think that it's called chat or attendee chat. I see many of you have done already. So thank you very much uh, and welcome um, for those joining in Brazil. Uh, hello from uh, from Brazil and from wherever you are in the world. Um, uh, let us uh, kick this off. Have you ever wanted to hear learning experts with different, differing views? Let me start that again. Have you ever wanted to hear learning experts with differing views explore ways in which they disagree? Well, this is our opportunity to listen in on a couple of L&D titans as they debate. I'm David James, your host, and this is L&D, lively and disagreeable. A very special welcome to Guy Wallace and Nick Shackleton-Jones. We'll come to you both very shortly. Before then, I'd like to welcome Gabrielle Bain, who will help me to lead this discussion today. Gabrielle, would you like to briefly introduce yourself and what you'd like to get uh, from Guy and Nick today? Sure, welcome everyone. So I am coming to this as someone who's been in the field of learning and development for over 20 years and has really uh, gone to that to transition of, of being performance-based over the last 10 years. And I know that both Nick and Guy have been hugely influential to me. I follow both of them and have learned so much from, from both of their work. Um, I use bits and pieces of it in everything that I do. And we had a very lively debate and a thread in LinkedIn Learning. And I just want to share uh, the, the gist of it. I, I believe Guy said it might be felt by some to be a misuse of L&D talent to be engaged in creating some fun event for networking purposes in casual information knowledge, knowledge exchanges or just a time away from work event. This could lead to a general perspective that L&D is all fun and games and not performance improvement. Then Nick said, well, which is better? an exciting networking event that improves retention, engagement, and performance, or a classroom event that ticks the learning objective box but achieves no measurable improvement. I thought that was a great debate. It was, it was, it was two of my, my favorite people who have strong opinions and ideas, you know, kind of going back and forth, and I'm like, you need to do a podcast. So here we are, and I'm very excited. So I, I actually thought starting out from there, where, where that conversation left off, might be a good place to start uh, in terms of that balance between performance, focus, measurable, versus the reality that sometimes people do just want those networking for fun events. Where, where, where do you draw the line? So uh, I'm gonna hand it over to you. Cool. And then I'm happy to kind of kick it off. And just to remind people, look, there's the attendee chat as well. So we'll, you know, let's not just make it this kind of boring, you know, to and fro. I'd love to hear what you think and, and your input to the debate as well. But I think that my position on it is that, and I think you sort of summed it up really well there, is that quite often we just kind of focus on creating educational events, you know, and we know that format, you know, we put some content in the slide where and somebody stands up or we do it digitally. But actually, if we really cared about experience and performance for our colleagues and our organizations, we would broaden our scope. We would be comfortable, for example, designing induction programs where people are excited about joining, where they feel a sense of belonging, because this makes a difference to the organization. People stay longer, people perform better. So actually, you know, education might be one of the ways in which you actually improve performance, but it actually might be the wrong tool for many of the things that we're trying to achieve. So 
that, that, that's kind of my, my position on things, that it's okay to run events which impact performance in other ways than trying to stuff content into people's heads. Um, so, you know, that that's my kind of start of a 10. Uh-oh, because I don't disagree, and I had agreed that I was going to be the disagreeable one. I've got, <laughs> so, so from my perspective, you know, we're, we're sometimes trying to create awareness or knowledge and skills and performance competence, and it all kind of depends on, you know, where the learner is in their performance and learning curves. Um, but, yeah, there's a time and a place for networking. I agree. I've had many clients, uh, a, a students in the classes, participants in, in the training that wanted to get together with their peers to discuss what they had just learned. And that wasn't necessarily easily available to them because of where they were geographically dispersed. And they wanted to come together. And they had, uh, one client in particular had a national conference where they brought in all the product managers. This was for AT&T back in the 80s. And, and the product managers, the new people, wanted to talk to their peers, wanted to talk to other newbies, if you will, and as well as some of the more experienced people. And they just wanted to learn from each other now that they had a basis for it. So part of the question I think was, you know, so what's the intent if we want, if the client, you know, he who pays the piper calls the tune. Mm -hmm. So if the client wants a networking event and wants to accomplish things other than performance competence, you know, the ability to perform tasks to produce outputs to stakeholder requirements, you know, there's a time and a place for both. And so I think we need to be open to that, but the client needs to know, you know, that's what we do. And if our policies as a learning and development organization are to take on those kind of assignments, well, then that's okay. If our policy is quite different and we only do, you know, instruction for, you know, developing people's performance competence, then perhaps there's another organization in our enterprise that should tackle, you know, hosting and, and coordinating such a networking event. You know, as always, it depends. Yeah, but I guess to give a very real example, a, a fascinating uh, the way you kind of frame it, Guy, because I can understand that some organizations will basically say, in essence, you know, we only do education or to add a little bit of nuance to that, we only do education plus performance consulting. Um, but I also think that we can do education plus performance consulting plus experience design. Let, let me add a, a little bit of flavor to that. So I set the, the mission I set in my last kind of big job at, at Deloitte was to measurably improve the performance and experience of our colleagues. You know, and, and, and I guess if we're not there to do that, what are we there to do? So in a sense, mm -hmm. conventional educational techniques might be one string in our bow, but we need that broader brief. I'll give you a very real example. Deloitte at the time was building at Deloitte University just outside Paris. I think it's, it's probably live now. But through the pandemic, like many organizations, we learned that we could deliver the, the kind of the PowerPoint stuff over Zoom, right? So mm -hmm. imagine you're the chief financial officer and you're scratching your head, wondering why you're seeing all of these requests to uh, Euro shuttle people across to Paris, because you know now that if they're just going to be sitting in a room watching PowerPoint slides, <laughs> that that is a complete waste of money. So, so the argument we were beginning to put at that time was whatever the heck they're doing in these classrooms in this new building, it better not be sitting there looking at slides. Because if there's one thing for sure we learned through the pandemic, which is, you know, we can do that over Zoom or we can just send people the slideware. So I think it was a bit of a catalyst for rethinking what we were there to do. Mm -hmm. I, yeah, I think that's kind I of an age wanted... old issue though, that, you know, whether we're trying there to deliver information or whether we're there to help people practice what we, they've learned and give them, you know, corrective reinforcing feedback or or extinguishing kind of feedback to, to help them hone whatever knowledge and skills we're giving them. So I would agree that no one should be looking at a slide deck and that's all. To me, that's information exchange. That's not, you know, and I, and I go beyond education into looking at training where, where people are actually, you know, ha hands-on. You need to spend more of your time doing hands-on practice of what you're learning either on real work or simulated real work or something akin to that but it's got to be you know so so that you're you're doing near transfer yeah but look at how weird and strange what we're saying is in the in the broader context of what education does because i'm in absolute agreement so what i've said previously to teams is you're getting people together in a room 
I want to see that it's challenge, 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 challenge. I do not want to see that it's topic, 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 topic. I want to see that people are doing something, they're having to do something else, having to do something else. But how strange, how far that is from the conventional educational model, you know, and, and how difficult it is for many L&D people to get their heads around what that would look like. I, th I think there's a long way to go on that. Oh, I agree. It's, yeah, and it's been I, true I, since the seventies. You know, that's it's <laughs> it's, it's frustrating absolutely. for people who see it differently that we've not really evolved very much from yes. that model. Um, I'd like to tap into something that that guy started getting into in your comment, and that is the perception of L and D within an organization. Right? Um, you you mentioned that some of the risk of of focusing on a lot of these networking events is that, you know, people start to feel L&D is all just fun and games. And I think that's a real issue, especially for those of us who are in um, learning functions that are very new within our organization, right? So because it, it does not take as much planning or time to put together a networking event as it does some, some larger learning experience initiative. So I, I, you know, I'm personally facing that right now where great, we can do a mix every month, it's great, we've got these events, but then what people know L&D for is networking events, right? And so how do you balance that in terms of creating your own perception and brand of L&D with an organization while, while meeting those needs and balancing that with like performance, you know, measurable outcomes, et cetera? Well, that, that is the trick. And so it's, it depends on what the role of your L and D function is seen as, you know, you're a service or a support organization. So if the clients want to use you for those kinds of things, but, but I'm wary about the focus on fun. Now instruction can be fun, but uh, one of the things I learned from Dr. Richard E. Clark, Dick Clark, uh, a couple of decades ago was that what the research shows is that people who perceive training or learning as fun, don't put as much effort into it and effortful learning is really critical. So there's a time and a place. So I think it's all in terms of how you communicate and market what you, what this is. If it's not training, if it's education, if it's communications, if it's, you know, fun and games and networking, um, then we can, you know, we can engineer it uh, in a high, in a soft way to encourage engagement across the different audiences that are there through you know games or whatever but but we've got to be careful how we label everything if everything is called training or learning and it's mostly fun then that's going to taint how people think about that and they may well, not I, want to take I it seriously i think it's the other way around i think kirkpatrick made us make it fun i think we're coming away from fun let me explain i think I've been a, a trainer, many of the people listening may have been trainers, but because you could very rarely get level three and level four outcomes, you effectively ended up with happy sheets. And what did that mean? It meant that mm -hmm. we were just doing fun because we wanted the 4.6 or whatever on the happy sheet. When I've designed programs and, and I have that, that are much more challenging, you actually put people under some pressure, right? They fail. And you know, we want people sometimes, we engineer failure and that isn't fun. So in, in one particular leadership program, we had to say, we're going to do away with the, you know, the one to five, how much did you like the program? And instead, we're going to ask people how challenging was it? Because if it's a good program, it should be challenging. So I would argue the counter, which is that we did too much fun in the past because Kirkpatrick encouraged us to make sessions fun because that's how we got our scores. But now we actually have to, you know, we have to more intelligently challenge people, which might not be fun. It really is, you know. Yeah, that's uh, interesting because I learned about Kirkpatrick back in 1979 and my my mentors, my bosses at the time said, we start with level four and then we go to three if four isn't sufficient and we go to yeah. level two if it's not and then we go to one because we don't really, you know, but but I agree that too many in the profession have gravitated to a Kirkpatrick or Phillips type model where they're where they're looking at one, the happy and the smile sheets as something meaningful and there's been plenty of case studies going back to century one neil rackham talked about this uh, early on decades ago about you know people perceive the fun as 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 desirable and they don't want those desirable difficulties 
that really challenge people to really work at learning and, and honing and mastering the knowledge and skills required back on the job. This is this is interesting, and you know later I, I want to come back to this because I, I I have a question prepared for you, Nick, about the the whole the the feel. We always talk about what we want people to do in terms of the outcomes, um, but in your model, you also add the think and feel, which I think kind of sets what you do apart from some other uh, performance based methodologies. But I, I want to just pull it back for a moment and ask you a, a practical question, a scenario question, right? Um, so oftentimes uh, when we're trying to do performance-based work, um, part of it is that people, it, it, in our needs analysis, we find part of it is people don't have the skills. They genuinely don't know how to do it. But of course, there's all those other environmental things, part of your, your fishbone uh, uh, diagram guy of, of, you know, the environment and motivation and incentives and all these other things, right? So so let's say you have a needs analysis that, it, that shows that your managers need better people management skills. It, you see it in the exit surveys, you see it in other, uh, in focus groups, you, 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 you've gathered enough evidence to know that that is the case. However, for whatever the situation is in, in your environment, they don't have much motivation to do so. Either they're making so much money for the firm, nobody cares if they're good at managing people, or maybe, you know, it's, you know, they've been sailing and coasting for years and, and nothing's come of it, so why should they change? Whatever the issue is, I would like to hear from both of you how you would approach that. Who do you want to go first, uh, Gary? Yeah. I'm yeah. sorry, me? Yeah, who do you want You're to go me? first? Yeah. <laughs> well, I'm asking you, I'm actually going through this process right now myself. I'm actually still in the discovery phase of how I want to approach this. So, yeah. but I, I do think it's something very common where, yes, you know, skills and knowledge is part of the problem, but it's not all of the problem. It's there's other root causes, right? Yeah. That you can address some of it from training or performance support, but the success of that uh, will often be undermined by some of the other root causes. So yeah. are there ways to address that? Sure. And when do you say, you know what? I can do the training, but it's not going to even make enough of a difference to bother. Like, you know, where do you draw that line? I'll take a stab at it. So I've done I've done this not hundreds of times. That'd be overstatement, but certainly dozens of times. And especially with first level leaders, it's really pretty straightforward because in terms of their performance, there are some things that they won't do because they, they simply don't have the step by step guide. And there are other things that they won't do. And you alluded to this because they don't care. So the first thing to do is a training needs analysis is a terrible place to start because it assumes the answer in the question, it assumes that the answer is training. In some cases, they may need training. In other cases, they just may need to care about something more than they did. You know, this isn't a soft and fluffy issue. In BP, leaders needed to care about safety. And you don't get people to care about something by just loading them up with more and more content and information and guidance. So the answer to your question, really straightforward, is you, you understand what the, the desired outcomes are. So you talk to stakeholders. I use Think, Feel, Do. You know, Kathy Moore, for example, uses another approach. But you're just really crystal clear on if this program were a success, what would we see people doing differently? How would they be talking differently, behaving differently, and so on? And then second, you talk to people and you understand where do they need, you know, performance support and, you know, where will that help them to achieve those outcomes? But also, where do they need to actually care more about something? So a, a common example with leaders is developing their teams. They just don't care about it. They may also not care enough mm -hmm. about inclusivity. And so you treat those two problems in different ways where they care about something, but they just don't have the information give them their resources, but where they don't care about something, give them an experience that kind of fundamentally changes, you know, their their motivation uh, around that topic. Yeah, one of the things that I learned from the late Gary Rummler back in 1981, uh, I, was, uh, I came into Motorola one week before my official start date and attended a one day workshop he was giving. 
And he, and he talked about, well, the first thing you do when you're doing a performance analysis, not a training needs analysis, a performance analysis, you look and see, is there a process? And if there is, are people following it? Yes or no? And if not, why not, et cetera? And he said, the second thing I look at, before looking at knowledge and skills of the individual performers, I look at the consequence system to see what are we rewarding and what are we punishing? And if we are rewarding the poor behavior, the inappropriate behavior, then that's where we have to start because throwing training, instruction, learning at it isn't going to change anything if the consequence system rewards that unacceptable behavior. And the absence of any consequence system might allow the inappropriate behavior to exist because it's not being rewarded or punished or anything. So you need to look at that. This is a conversation you need to have with your client and the key stakeholders people generally up up the management chain from your target audience to, to ha engage them in this to have them draw the conclusions as to if we if we ch try to change people's behaviors in some sort of a classroom virtual or whatever uh, is it going to have any impact when they go back to the job because they're going to be entering that same performance context that rewards taking shortcuts with safety or treating people miserably to get the last thing out of them that you possibly can you know, and if, and so that's that's what you've got to attend to. And so your analysis has to look at the entire context, has to look at the consequence system, has to look at the data and information. The late Tom Gilbert said, the, we can have the largest impact on people's performance if we simply give them valid, credible data and make that available to them so that they can see. So for measuring the right things and like the quality world, putting charts on the wall so the guy can see that his behaviors are causing people to exit, well, maybe he'll stop because he's got data and information and perhaps that's enough of a consequence to him. Yeah, but that's in interesting. Every case, it, it, it's not enough to look at the reward system in the organization which sits around a set of behaviors. You know, let, let me explain. When you talk to new leaders, the primary thing that is driving them um, motivationally is they want to fit in and they want to show up in a certain way you know, with their peers. And so I guess I'm building on what you're saying, Guy, which is that's one element of it. But unless you really understand what motivates people, I'll give a real practical example of building out, a, a, was building out a safety program. And that safety program was very successful, but we took it to another culture, it was a South American culture, and it didn't work. The, the business outcomes in terms of near misses and whatever weren't being achieved. And the recommendation I made at the time was, well, go back and talk to your audience and find out what's really motivating them. And it turned out that in this particular culture, it was a macho culture where if you told somebody about a risk, they would actively take that risk to demonstrate <laughs> that they were they were super heroic, right? That they could take the risk mm. and survive. So it was counterproductive. <laughs> you know, what my point is, without understanding that motivational context, you couldn't kind of fix the problem and that wasn't just about you know how the reward system was set up within the organization it was more about how a person perceived themselves you know and and, and yeah. what they felt they were there to do i think the cultural aspect is really key because we can't presume you know uh, people talk about a culture in a company as if there is one <laughs> that's not true yeah. there yeah. are multiple cultures multiple re uh, consequence systems reinforcing uh, people's attitudes are different everywhere, and it takes some work to uncover that, um, you know, location by location almost, and we can't presume that our one-size-fits-all approach is going yeah. to work. We have to be more willing to really dig a little bit deeper and to adapt what we have to fit that particular situation. Yeah. Right. All right, Gabrielle. So thank you. I... I this is really interesting because I, I hear from Guy talking about looking at the rewards, the consequences, like all of the um, policy things in the environment that that's fueling motivation. And then Nick, I'm hearing you also talk about culture, but also what do people care about in general, right? And in, in creating these experiences um, to 
get at what they care or maybe make them care more. And I, I would like to talk a little bit more about that because I, I'm one of those people that in theory, that sounds awesome, but I, I feel like I'm not quite sure how to go about even doing that. So like, how do you make, how do you create experiences that make people care? Right. So, so that I, you need to write another book on that. That's my request. <laughs> but um, what I, what I want to talk about is, is your different um, models because you're both, major thought leaders in performance-based learning. And you have you both have books and um, blogs and, and a lot of great opinions and socks on this. And I, I'd like you to talk about what differentiates your approach. How did you come to, to your approach? Um, but also where do your methods agree and diverge? So I don't know, um, Nick, if you'd like to start or, or Guy, uh, oh, talk yeah, to us I mean, a little bit about that. Because I think most of us here are here because we, we are already proponents of performance-based learning. So let's dig a little deeper into the nuance. Sure, I'll, I'll have a quick stab. Um, I think that my approach differs because it's actually based on a theory of learning. I think a lot of L&D is actually effectively just kind of rain dancing. You know, it's a ritual that the business kind of funds and tolerates because people kind of like it, but they're never quite convinced that it, it does anything. And I was going backwards and forwards to conferences over the years, seeing the same questions being asked and not answered. You know, how do we evaluate, um, you know, learning? How do we design learning properly? And for me, I think the fundamental flaw, what I eventually came to the conclusion was we don't have a, a simple general theory of learning that we're actually using in the way that if you're a bridge builder, you'd use kind of laws of physics to govern. You wouldn't just kind of, you know, figure things out as you go along and, uh, and maybe you would, and you'd have a bunch of rituals and things that are handed down, which is, I think what we've got. But to answer your question more directly, I think this is the difference. If you're trying to change performance, if you're trying to change performance, you can do that in one of two ways, basically. You can change the context in a way that eliminates the need to learn. So if I want you to go to the supermarket and reliably get 50 items, a simple way I can do that is to give you a list of those items. The point of that list is not to encourage you to learn, it's to reduce your need to learn. So you can change somebody's performance by learning elimination. And I think predominantly that's what performance consulting does. The other alternative to change somebody's performance is you can build their capability. And that's what experience design does. And that's a fundamentally different thing to do. So just to sum up, at the beginning of a project, you have to make an intelligent decision. Are we going to give everybody checklists so that they don't have to learn anything at all? Or are we going to give them some AI guidance system so we can employ cheap labor? Or are we going to invest in actually the thing that, you know, Guy was talking about earlier, practicing and challenging in ways that it's more expensive, but we will actually be building their capability. And so... That, that's my position is that, they, that there are those two things that you can do based on that fundamental, you know, thinking about learning. So my response to that is the very first thing I was given in my first day of the job out of college was a 1970 newsletter by the late Gary Rumler and the late Tom Gilbert from their organization Praxis. And it talked about guidance, the short way home. Now, guidance right. later became known as job aids and then perform electronic performance support systems, et cetera, et cetera. But they talked about how to reduce the, the demands on the individual to memorize all sorts of things. Yeah. And it took me decades later to come up with, you know, does the performance context allow a referenced performance response to use performance guides or job aids or resources, or does it demand all the time or just some of the time a memorized performance response where there is no time to look something up to reference something and so therefore that's where we should focus our time and attention for learning for memorizing the knowledge and skills that are necessary to perform but otherwise we should give people the guidance that they need to do the job in the workflow or process flow or work streams but, but when we talk about, you know, looking at the performance context and looking at all the variables, to me, it's much broader than the knowledge and skills. And one of the things I saw at Motorola in 1981 was the Ishikawa diagram, which came out of the quality movement in Japan and Professor Ishikawa from the 1950s. And this was something that quality circles used to diagnose problems. And it talked about the 4M models, very non 
politically correct. Men, materials, machines, and methods. And that showed me a context for where the men, where the people were, and they and all these things contributed to their ability to perform in the process. And so to me, performance consulting, which used to mean back in the 70s and 80s, looking at all the variables of performance, right now it, it tends to have been boiled down to looking at how do I do performance-based instruction, which to me is inclusive of performance guides and learning experiences. But but we can need to look at what's the data, what's the consequence system, what are the physical attributes the performer needs that has nothing to do with knowledge and skills, but combines with knowledge and skills. What are the intellectual capabilities, psychological capabilities? Am I, you know, as a salesperson, am I psychologically attuned to getting 27 rejections before I get a sale, which is the average it used to be back in, in, in for some of my clients, where you would go through 27 rejections before you'd get a sale. Well, some people cannot do that and others can. So part of what we can help with our approach to looking at performance is decide what other uh, organizational systems and processes need to be involved in helping us solve the performance problems or opportunities that exist. Do we need recruiting to recruit and select differently based on what the job requires, because we can handle the awareness, knowledge, and skills that people need, but we can't make, you know, have them doing exercise and building up their physical strength so that they can have the stamina to do the job all day long. You know, that's, so, so we need to stay in our lane and work with other organizations who are all in place to help all their support and service organizations in the enterprise to help improve the performance of the enterprise, the processes, and the people. Yeah, and I, I'd like to, to build on that if it's okay, Guy. I think we should, to be emphatic, I think we should stop building learning pathways. You know, I, I've, I, I am so sick of learning pathways, which have become a kind of a cottage <laughs> industry where people are just um, slotting Nick, together content. Can you just define what you mean by learning pathway? Just so sure, everyone's I clear. Think... We've got yeah. a terminology issue in our field, so I just want to clarify. I think one of the things I've seen in organizations is that L&D people don't quite know to do what to do with this vast library of, say, LinkedIn learning or, or you know, library of content that somebody's purchased. And they, they fall into this kind of order taking pattern where somebody approaches them. Um, with a request and they say well we'll build a pathway for that and they sort of effectively kind of google whatever it is leadership or you know coaching and they just you know drag and drop if you like all of the modules with that keyword in it into a pathway and then suggest people follow them the reason i think that's a bad idea is it doesn't really help people with the job and i think this is probably it's an it, it's an easy thing to say but there's too much of it happening you know to guy's point we should take the time to find out what people are struggling with in the job because that is their learning pathway. Their learning pathway is the job. And, and if we actually wanted to help them to progress, we wouldn't be getting them to compete lots of little modules. We'd be saying, look, if you want to go from this role to that role, in your current role, you need to be competent at these tasks. And in that role, you need to be competent at those tasks over there. And here's the skills matrix and the, and the kind of supporting learning, which will help you get from A to B instead of just encouraging people to, to do learning for the sake of it, because it looks good you know, for, for our L&D records. So um, oh, somebody said they're just building pathways. Yes. Look, if you are building pathways, just make sure that the pathways closely correspond to what people have actually said they are having to do in the, in the job, you know, because that's what drives people's yes. learning. It's not the day a year that they get in the L&D, you know, classroom. You know, it's not all the e-learning modules that the, um, they have to complete for compliance reasons. What's driving people's learning is the job. And we are there to support them with all the stuff that they're struggling with. And we can do that. We can do it wonderfully well. Yeah, I've been doing so uh, what much. nowadays called Learning Pathways since 1981. And I did my first one at Motorola, and then I became a consultant, and I've done 76 of them for my client organizations. But they're performance-based training and development or learning and development paths. Um, and other, what I've seen over the decades, though, that people do something similar is they create a collection of courses. And so they've just gone, here's this, this skill that's reasonable. It's got face validity, but it's, but they, and so they assemble all this generic content and, and sequence it some way, but it, it doesn't match what the job needs and it doesn't address, address how to apply that knowledge or skill, which may be valid 
in, in your job. And so we expect people mm -hmm. to learn generic things in, in kind of an educational mode and then figure out on their own how to apply it in the job. Ultimately, they, that may be effective, but it's certainly not efficient. And people struggle with that. So we can do more direct instruction on the high stakes, high risk, high reward performance, leave the low risk stuff to you know informal learning means and they'll figure it out. And if they don't quite so soon, it's not that big a deal anyway. We need to focus on the high stakes stuff and really help people learn how to master doing the tasks that produce outputs that will meet the stakeholder requirements. And then we'll have good worthy outcomes versus you know, uh, insufficient outcomes. You know, Did we meet the regulatory requirements? Well, that's a good outcome if we did. If we didn't, that's a bad outcome. So we really need to mm -hmm. focus on performance first and then extract what are the enabling knowledge and skills. And then we need to understand the learners. What do they already know? Oh, some of them know this, but some of them don't. So we need to modularize the content so people can get what they need as they climb that learning curve and performance curve so that they can truly master their jobs back on the job. Yeah, and I'm, uh, somebody said in the in the questions, and I'm reading all the comments as we go, so thank you for those. What about learning pathways as additional pool style learning? But you know, this is the point, Google, is a beautiful example of pool style learning, right? Your washing machine breaks down and you go on, jump on Google and you're like, how do I fix? You type in the model number, but here's the point. That's not a pathway, right? Nobody would appreciate having to complete, you know, all these modules on how to fix these different things with different things. It's like, as you hit a problem, you have to the pull the stuff. So you create right. effectively a pool of the resources and performance support that are, are tagged if you like, to the problems that you're going to encounter. And as you hit the problems, a common one, right? People join an organization, they have to complete expenses, or they have to book holiday, or, you know, they, they don't know how to do the sickness leave. And um, it, 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 it's no point in seeing people in a classroom and tra trailing people through all of those processes. It, it, rather, just have resources that they can draw down on as they hit the problem, because the pathway is the job. Yeah, exactly. I agree. Yeah. Thank, sorry, thank you sorry so not much. to be disagreeable. I, 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 we're agreeing far too much. No, yeah, yeah. we were waiting for the... the, the I told you this was going to be more about out. heated agreements <laughs> than, than disagreements. All right. So I actually want to pause just right now, and, and I have I have so many more questions I'd personally love to ask you, but I would like to just make sure that we have time to address questions that have been coming in through the chat. So, uh, David, if you want to go to there, if, if there... There, if, if we think I would love to, to hear both of you talk about it, is a little bit more about soft skills and leadership development, because I think it's a lot murkier there to apply performance based things than than more um, uh, tactical, technical skills. But I, I want to first make sure that we address uh, the questions that have been coming in. So, so David. Uh, yes, thanks, Gabrielle. And I'm going to apologize, first of all, because I could just do these chronologically, but I feel as if we'd be um, in breach of the Trade Descriptions Act, if we didn't seek at least some disagreeability. So, I, um, so this, so this is probably the last question that was uh, was popped in here. But I think it might actually get us uh, some uh, uh, some conflict, potential <laughs> conflict. So, what's your view on future skills development as organisations attempt to prepare their people for skills they think they'll need in the future? Uh, but uh, but don't have uh, a present application. And it does kind of link with uh, with something we had earlier on about uh, how do you balance what an organization requires its people to do with what we've been talking about, which is helping individuals with what they're expected to do, where, where to your point, Nick, there's concern from their side. Perhaps we can roll those up into one. Nick, um, can I ask you first? Yeah, I mean, sure. It reminds me of the great horse manure crisis of 1912. The Times of London reported that there were so many horses in London that if the growth continued at the current rate, that the London itself would be buried in six foot of manure in the next kind of coming years. And the future skills crisis is a little bit like that. All of those people throwing their hands up and saying, what are we going to do? And, and the answer is that the horse manure crisis never materialized because we invented cars. And what we've done is invented AI and performance support and other systems. And that will eliminate the need for people to have skills scary kind of you know proposition there but competitively as an organization you need to reduce the need 
you know, to upskill people because otherwise you're going to be wasting a lot of money. You're going to be hiring a lot of expensive skilled people. Look at what Uber did. Uber only exists because GPS, a, a learning elimination system, was introduced. You know, prior to that, taxi drivers had to know, you know, every street in London, in London at least. Imagine how time consuming that was. Imagine that they could command a higher, higher salary. So we play a really important role in that as L&D, as we look at things like AI, but more simply checklists, guidance, performance support. We can enable competitive advantage for our organizations by enabling them to hire people with less capability who can follow the guidance and actually perform to a, a higher level. So, you know, although this sets people's teeth on edge, I think sometimes in L&D, one of the best things we can do for our organizations is to eliminate learning so that they don't face a skills crisis in future. Brilliant, and Guy? So, I, so, so in 1981, when I was at Motorola, I was in my second job. I was all fired up about performance-based instruction known as training back in those days. And and then I didn't like the word education because that was soft and it wasn't specific to uh, 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 how to apply something in people's jobs. And my clients at Motorola manufacturing managers wanted an introductory course on computers because back in 1981, computers were still just coming to the factory floor and weren't there yet on that old. And and so and I pushed back on them on this. And I, because I wanted, you know, computers to do what? And they said, we don't know. We just want them to have a general knowledge about computers and computer technology and blah, blah, blah. And, and they told me that, that, you know, we expect our people to figure out how they'll use this tool if they only understand that tool. And that was an epiphany for me to know that there is a place for education where we give people knowledge and skills, but we don't tell them how to apply it. You know, because in general, I think that's what the majority of, of our action should be is how to do that unless we can avoid memorization by giving them performance guides or, or resources. But I think that there is a place for education. And this kind of goes to the soft skills thing uh, Gabriel was going to ask about. But but I so there is a uh, there is a place for this. So but the whole skills mania that everybody is under now is reminiscent to me of competencies from 20 and 30 years ago which 40 years ago was on behaviors. And Tom Gilbert wrote in his book, his 1978 book, Human Competence, about the cult of behaviors. Beware the cult of behaviors, where we're focused on behaviors, but we don't understand what were the output are people trying to produce. So we don't even know if it's behaviors are situational, and sometimes you're the good cop or the bad cop, depending on the situation. We just teach behaviors as if that's the ends. And behaviors are a means to the ends, just like skills or competencies are the means to the ends of worthy performance in his terminology. So I think that the whole skills mania, if we take that approach, we can give people skills and maybe expect them to figure it out. Or once we, the organization figures out how those skills apply in the workflows, then we need to, to bookend the generic skills with you know, why would you learn this? What's in it for you? What's in it for the organization? How does this apply? Learn the generic skill and then provide sufficient practice with feedback, whether that's on real work or in some sort of a simulation in a training context. You know, we need to do that because I believe what the research shows is that people, the majority of people, only five to 15 percent, according to Richard Clark, can learn out of context and apply it in a new context. So if we don't teach people how to apply things in their context, might, they might struggle, not everybody, but the majority of them will struggle with figuring out how to apply that. And again, ultimately they may be effective in figuring that out, but they won't be efficient in doing so. Great, thanks Guy. Um, another question, and again, uh, we've, we've got some brilliant questions here about the practical application of what you guys are great at but matthew murray has been has played to the theater of this uh, and so i'm going to go so i'm going to ask his question um and he's asked what's the one thing about nick's work that guy disagrees with and vice versa <laughs> Well, you know, I've read I read his book. It took weeks for it to get over here to the States from uh, Europe when it first came out. But I agreed with this book and I, I didn't disagree with anything. Now, what, what became apparent to me was 
language differences. So one of the things I learned in the 90s is it's not just semantics, it's always semantics. So it took me forever to figure out what green trainers were. And he referenced that in his book. And it took me pages and pages and pages to figure out that that was running shoes, what we would call back in the States. And so so the language always is a hang up. But 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 I, I agree with what he has written and his approach to things. And I, and I think, so if you look, see disagreements, it's really at, at the semantics level. It's not in the fundamental what we believe or how we approach things. I think we are very much aligned. We just talk about it differently, which was true of all of my mentors. So I learned this a long time ago that I had to really work hard to understand what people were saying because they were using different language, different labels for things, configuring their imagery differently, but it was really all kind of the same. Sorry. Can I ask a question on that then, then a guy, because what I, I feel like your work is so clear, especially for technical training in, in, and workflows, right? But from, from the way you work, how do you address, you know, how you would like participants to feel, right? Well, so, um, or the experiences that would um, yeah. uh, create uh, an emotional response. So I, I so I recall the my first week on the my first day on the job at Motorola. Neil Rackham, the author of Spin Selling, came in and he was teaching us, and he talked about ten design criteria, and one of them was to create a low threat environment. And one of the, so one of the things I think we need to understand people in those contests, is, is it fearful? Is it scary? How do they feel about this? Like it's a slam dunk and they will have no problem or that they will struggle. We need to deal with people and their emotional states in performance and in learning. You know, are we, you know, going to show that guy doesn't know what he's doing and here he is in the classroom with a bunch of people and can we lower the threat to people so that they can learn, you know, without feeling they're under the gun and all that. So I don't know if that goes that way to answering that, but I think it is really critical. And one of the things that I always paid attention to, I extracted out of my development phase in an Addy sense, the pilot testing, the final acid test of my instruction and does it really work? And I was always conscious of the fact that until that point when I was doing the training, the very first delivery, if you will, it, was I creating a threatening environment that we didn't see before? How were people reacting and debriefing them about that, debriefing the, the typical learners that were involved in the pilot experience and the master performers that were involved in the pilot experience? Did they sense that this was going to be a low threat learning environment for people? Because I think that's really key and critical. Now, that's not the full extent of it all, but I think that, that I was taught to think about those kinds of things using different language than Nick uses, but I, but I agree with, you know, that's, that's how we have to approach things. So I, interestingly that you refer to Addy. So I think I became very dissatisfied with Addy and, and more generally with what I see as L and D whitewash. So I think Addy is just kind of whitewash, which is it, the, basically the model is, well, you analyze the problem, you design something and then you evaluate if it worked. And the problem with that is, whilst it sounds commonsensical um, and indisputable almost, is that it's just a license to do ever what the heck you you want to do, right? And so it lends itself to lots of re weird, ritualized behaviors. The same is true, I think, today with what's being called like evidence-based practice, which I think is is so anti-scientific and is another kind of form of, of whitewash. Because if you understand science at a very basic level, science argues from the specific to the general, from the general to the specific. What I mean by that is all practices should be based on a theory, which is the general thing. And the theory should be supported by evidence, which is the specific thing that goes up and down. If you don't understand that, you know, real read Karl Popper, it's hypothetical deductive model, but it's so dangerous to say your evidence, your, your practices are evidence-based. Give you a simple example. Let's say my HR director hauls me into the office one day and says, Nick, why the hell have you spent 50% of your learning budget on lemons? You say, I can't walk into a corridor without seeing somebody clutching a, a damn lemon. And I say, 
it's all evidence based. You know, there is evidence that shows that citrus fruits and there is, by the way, if you're interested, can improve learning in certain contexts. Right. So I've I've spent half my budget on lemons. And what I'm seeing is that everybody is now cherry picking some kind of evidence to actually support whatever the heck it is that they, they feel like they're doing. You know, I'm sure there's evidence around music improving learning. And so this is corrosive. This whitewash approach that we have is just hiding the problem. And so I think probably the, the most radical thing in answer to your question, you know, about where do I, I disagree is I think some people don't realize just how provocative how people learn, which is it is as a book, which is I'm saying that beneath behaviorism, beneath cognitive psychology, beneath linguistics, beneath Vygotsky and Piaget, there is a unified explanation of learning, which we can use to build a foundation for a solid set of practices that, that kind of deliver outcomes. And I think that's the most radical part of the book, saying that, you know, we've got to stop whitewashing the problem and actually really go go back to basics and how people learn. Great. Well, uh, there's another question's come in, uh, and uh, this is from John Haynes. And what I like about John's question is, I, th I think he's declaring all-out war. If because if you two are going to yeah, agree yeah. a lot, uh, I think that he's he so he's nipped in and said, uh, doesn't Nick's view on challenges over topics fly in the face of the need to create a lower threat learning environment? Well, I think that's where you start. So if you incrementally build people's capabilities, their competence, and their confidence you can take them into the challenging environment. So I don't, I, you know, I think it depends on how you look at it. So we've got to, you know, sometimes you throw people into the deep end to start with, and sometimes you start in the shallow end of the pool and get them out to the deep end over time. So you have to look at that situation, who the learners are and what the, what the performance requirements are. Yeah, and it's such an interesting question because people will often say quite glibly, we learn best from our mistakes, right? That's and they're sort of hinting at what I'm talking about, right? But people are also also traumatized and damaged by their mistakes. So having yeah. spent you know decades you know creating environments, there's something in what you're saying, guy. I'd express it differently, but I think we're saying the same thing, which is you've got to create an environment of psychological safety. It's got to feel playful. It doesn't have to be feel fun, but where people can try things, like a leader can try having a difficult conversation with somebody, or somebody can try a difficult technical procedure. BP used to spend millions on simulators of drill simulator so people could fail you know but not be completely crushed by that experience and so you're absolutely right when you challenge people you are going to change them but you run the risk if you push them too hard that you will damage them in that process so it becomes a really important thing to create a space which is calibrated for different people but also feels where it's safe to fail you know it's psychologically safe i agree great well um uh, we this is a question we had uh, right near the beginning so uh, so, so we did get there in the end um, now this speaks to I think um, a conflict that happens in learning and development that might actually be uh, sometimes of an organization's or learning and development's creation and that is the role of leadership and line managers uh, and their responsibility in the development of their team so what is the role of the, the learning function and what is the role of line managers and what's the risk of getting this wrong? I'll give you an example. Uh, there are plenty of people who aren't properly onboarded in an organization because learning and development have decided yeah. they are gonna deliver this and that they've assumed that everything to do with the role or the cultural assimilation is down to the line manager. So they don't, they don't get close enough to the real need. What are your thoughts? Well, it's super fast. It, I mean, it fails because leaders and line managers think that learning is education. When they, when they say the word learning, they think this is somebody standing in a room with a board, you know, pointing at words on a screen or something. And they think that is not my job. I'm a leader. That's the, the L&D, the HR team's job to do that stuff. Right. So as long as they think of learning as education, they won't do it. But to give one story and then I'll hand over to Guy. Um, I was talking to a senior partner at Deloitte who said one of the key turning points in her career was that she led a meeting when she was still relatively junior for the first time. And that's the point is that leaders play such an important role because the real learning path is the stuff that people are having to do on the job. And who is there every day holding the hand or pushing people on? It's not the L&D team. It's the, the leader. So I think they play such an important role, you know, tens of times more important than L&D, but they push it away if they think it's just education. Yeah, back in 1986, I was doing that uh, uh, learning and development path, training and development path for product managers at at and I talked about them a little bit earlier. And on the front end of my path is onboarding that leads to ongoing development. 
And in the onboarding portion, there was, you know, introductions to your organization, to your job, to your team, to all these things. And my project steering team, the uh, high level managers and the four business uh, units that, that we were uh, helping, they said their, their supervisors are too busy to do that. So they won't do that. We can't trust them to do that. And I said, well, you know, you guys need to demand it, expect it, monitor it, and, you know, provide consequences if they do it or they don't do it. They go, well, we can't do that because we're too busy too. So I ended up creating a bunch of do-it-yourself interview guides resources for the product, new product managers to go around and interview their boss and pin their boss down into in terms of what is my job? What do you expect from me? Do I do this, 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 and this, and this? Yes or no? What are the key dates on my calendar coming up? Things, what do you expect me to do in these meetings coming up? And then go to do the same thing with their peers, with their product teams, with their customers, and do a do-it-yourself orientation because the organization wasn't going to do that and my clients knew that. So I put the onus on the learners to help onboard themselves and they were given license because they had this official interview guide and they had to fill it out and people had to sign it at the bottom and so everybody got used to oh this was just how we were going to go do this but it gave the learner the performers what they needed to understand about the job as they made their entry into that and then of course there were the immediate survival skills that varied based on their specific assignments that they had to get you know to kind of complete their onboarding uh, wonderful. We, we've uh, we've nearly got to uh, to the very end, but uh, but um, we we do have a, a, a very interesting question that I'd just like to get your thoughts on before we do. We really do just have a couple of minutes left. Um, AI is clearly generative AI has been the hot topic, not just in learning and development, but all over the news since uh, uh, since the the tail end of last year. So, what are your hopes and fears uh, for the impact uh, of generative AI? on learning and development and the uh, both the role and the outcomes uh, that, are, that are sought from L&D. Nick. Well, okay, I mean, okay, very quickly. I think let's just imagine for the sake of argument that learning is driven by your experiences. If you think back on your own life and I ask you about what have been some of the biggest turning points in your learning, they will generally have been experiences. So AI isn't going to touch that. You know, people are going to university for the experience. They want to get the certificate, of course, but they forget everything they learn. So AI doesn't really touch that. It doesn't touch the three or four year experience. What AI does is what GPS has done in for people in their cars. You know, Guy and I are both old enough, I guess, to remember having to use maps to navigate. All of that a, a capability vanished. And so AI will be hugely important for competitive advantage for organizations precisely because it will eliminate the need for people to learn, you know, and we will have to, I think, think carefully about where we want to invest in buildings, building people's capability when AI can pick up so much of the load. But one sort of final thought is that organized people might not want to join organizations if they don't feel that organization is investing in them and actually building their capability and is just patching everything with AI. Yeah, I agree with that. And from my perspective, uh, it will generate generic content, which we could have gone and gotten some other way. So it'll be quicker and cheaper and faster in doing that. But how does that apply to my specific workflow? It's not going to know that unless we feed that information into a system, our proprietary processes, et cetera. So I'm looking forward to the day that AI can do the analysis to understand what are my outputs? What are the stakeholders? for that output, what do they really want? How are we doing against that now? What are my tasks? What do the stakeholders for tasks want? How am I doing against that? And then align the generic, if you will, enabling knowledge and skills to that and combine all of that into design. But I think we're a ways off from that. But, but mm -hmm. Richard Clark was exploring uh, uh, using AI to do cognitive task analysis, which was to get beyond the behavioral tasks, the overt tasks that we can see and count and measure and get to the thinking tasks and, and begin to extract those too. So I think that AI will be a tool and useful in our attempt to put together content, uh, resources or courses that will help people master their jobs. Yeah, but just to put it slightly more rudely, if your job as an L&D person was copying and pasting stuff from Google into slide decks, 
and you thought that that was was learning, then AI is a huge threat. But just say for the sake of argument, your job is actually creating transformative experiences, getting people together and doing something with them, which really changes them, whether to Guy's point, you know, they're practicing something or doing something together or, you know, or, or networking or having some kind of experience that makes them feel like they belong or they're valued. Or, how is AI going to change that? It's not. So if you are stuck in the old world, AI is a threat. If you've actually moved to the new world, you know, AI is, is much less of a threat. Wonderful, well put, Nick, and uh, and uh, I love a great closing comment there. Um, uh, thank you very much, Gabrielle, Guy, and Nick, yes. uh, for for your contributions today. Uh, we've had uh, incredible feedback uh, on here, and we've had um, a request for round two, uh, and I think Yay. that uh, that uh, that that uh, I'd certainly enjoy that hugely. And we'd uh, we'd had conversations previously of uh, of whether we have round two with Guy, Nick, and Gabrielle, or whether we uh, yes. we we switch this up. Depending on the topics and the point of views, I think that this would be uh, hugely interesting and valuable uh, if we if we had differing views uh, regarding particular topics. So uh, so uh, until next time, and hopefully there will be a next time. Thank you again, uh, Nick, Guy, and Gabrielle, and thank you everybody for joining us today for lively and disagreeable. Thanks, Gabrielle. Thank, thank you so much. Okay.